Good evening, and welcome to the St. Petersburg by Night Podcasting Network. Tonight, we present to you our behind-the-scenes show, After Dark. everyone and welcome to the St. Pete by Night Twitch channel where we play St. Petersburg by Night, a massive multiplayer 5th edition World of Darkness Chronicle set in St. Petersburg, Florida. My name is Kent, also known as Misha Kent. You can find me on all social media, but that's not important. What you should do is go follow St. Pete by Night on all of the social medias listed down below and in the descriptions on Twitch and YouTube and wherever your favorite podcasts are found. I've been harping on this for the last couple of streams, but we are in a podcast form now. So if you are not caught up on all of our incredible stories, if you're not caught up on these amazing After Dark conversations that we've had, you can do so by going to your favorite podcast uh, provider and looking for St. Pete by Night. And then you can subscribe, download, or stream all of those episodes, including on Spotify. So if you you know want to listen to us in the car or during your workday or while you're cleaning around the house... There is an option available to you if you can't keep up in the video format. So go check that out. This is After Dark because it is Saturday night. And on After Dark, we talk to a lot of the people behind the scenes that make St. Pete by Night as well as the World of Darkness what it is. We talk to storytellers. We talk to players. We talk to influencers. And we talk to creators who make the World of Darkness as amazing as it is. And tonight we have the very, very special privilege of talking to one of our incredible partnered vendors who help make St. Pete by Night a reality, help keep us keeping the lights on and keeping us functioning because of their support. The creator we are talking to tonight is Dragon Ink Dice, one of the amazing, amazing dice manufacturers who helps supply our community with incredible incredible sets of dice and i am very 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 happy to say that tonight we are also doing a very special giveaway from dragon ink dice that's right with the hashtag dice me please in the chat throughout the whole evening you can win that very set of dice that you see on screen right now from dragon ink dice they are absolutely gorgeous and i have had the privilege of holding some of Dragon Ink Dice's dice in my hands, and I can tell you they are top-notch quality, and you will love this set of dice, and you can get it for free tonight by just putting the hashtag DiceMePlease in the chat, which will give you the opportunity to be in the running for that set of dice. But without further ado, let's say hello to Katie, the creator the magician who makes dragoning dice a possibility katie say hello and introduce yourself 
Hello. Well, like you said, I'm Katie. Uh, some people call me Scryer because of my Twitch streaming days. It was an odd name that I went by that made no sense with what I did. Uh, I've been doing this for a few years now. Yeah. And I'm excited. I'm so excited to get into yeah. all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about not just your involvement in the dice making process, which I think will be a majority of this conversation mm -hmm. because I just love all of the science that goes into this, not to mention the creativity. I mean, we saw with some of those dice in your shop that you can do such incredible things in this medium to bring oh, yeah. that creativity to life. And I'm excited to break down how that happens. But what I'm also excited to talk about is how you got into TTRPGs and gaming as a whole. I mean, there's always an interesting story that brings people to this mm -hmm. hobby. And the fact that people can take not just the hobby itself, but turn it into a career or turn it into an artistic endeavor is so fascinating as well. So why don't we start there? How did you discover TTRPGs and what about it appealed to you? Did you have any preconceived notions going into it or any reputation about it? And then what made you decide to take the plunge into it? So it's actually interesting. Uh, my first delve into TTRPGs was actually a, a growing hatred for it because it was my father's thing to do. Really? And, uh, yeah. Uh, my earliest memory of it was hiding under a card table in my parents' living room as everyone was just playing that and not being able to do anything else because that's <laughs> what they were doing. And until I was about 23, I was against ever touching one because that's what they did, not me. So that's so fascinating to me because, you know, Gaming mm -hmm. can be a generational thing, but I've often found that people have found it because they weren't into sports like their parents were, or they weren't into, you know, whatever their parents were into. But you had the opposite effect where yeah. you're they were into it, but then you ended up getting a really bad taste in your mouth because of it and would hold off yes. on plunging into it for two decades, over two decades before you leapt into it. That is so interesting to me. So yeah. when, what was it that made you decide to take the leap? When did you say, okay, you know, I'm going to try this for myself? So it actually I, is because of him also. I went down to Texas after I graduated college and he was going there every week DMing for a group. And I was like, now hold on. I can help you make fun puzzles. I can help you write strange riddles for people. Let, and so I was helping him do that. And then we did a one shot of, um, oh, some, some game I have not heard of again since then. And... I remember it, somebody died in the session immediately on introducing their character because a bag of nuts exploded. Uh, it was interesting. And then I didn't touch it again for a while because I went back home and we weren't playing it at all. That's so, and, that's just so yeah. incredible to me, like to see people getting into it, you know, so much later in life, uh, especially having been around it so much, but it mm -hmm. totally makes sense because it's like, oh, that's what my parents do. That's not my, that's not my, my thing. thing. So what my were thing was you music. Into? Okay, music. What kinds of music did you like? Uh, you know, just generic pop, whatever was on the radio at the time. Got really into jazz because I was part of a vocal jazz group in high school. And thought that that's what I was going to do with my life. Surprise? I'm so, not. I am not uh, on the next big singer. Lo and behold, but the thing that you were avoiding all of your life has now become is your now life's work. Yes. <laughs> that's absolutely amazing. So when you did actually, rather than try it, jump into it, was D&D &D kind of your starting game or your starting platform? Yeah, so... <laughs> The, this whole thing is very convoluted because I didn't actually get into a D&D &D game until two years after I started making dice. Oh, really? Okay, so the yeah. dice came first. The dice the came gaming. first. Okay, all right. What What about dice making appealed to you and how did you find your way into that? Okay. Big story. 
Uh, 2020 is the answer. Okay. Overarching. Um, I had just quit my full-time job to go work at a bookstore because I didn't want to work at a thrift store anymore. It was not fun. And I had been there for less than a couple months when everything closed down. They're like, well, you don't get to stay on our pay. And at the time I had started deep diving into researching other people's dice making at the time. And I've just been reading on Facebook all of the different techniques, watching every video I could find, looking at every photo. I still have so many of them saved on my phone from back then. And at that same exact time, once again with my dad, we had started up a different Twitch group called the Dice Cult. And I was like, well, I can make dice for them. I just have to get masters made. I just have to go full force and I can do it. And so I did. <laughs> Speaking of the Dice Cult, I want to give them a big shout out as one of the plugs for you this evening. They do have a Twitch channel here on Twitch, and you can find them at twitch.tv slash the Dice Cult, all one word. Uh, and your company is actually listed as one of the artwork companies on that mm -hmm. page. Uh, so go give them some support and love as well, uh, because it does help support our amazing guest here nice. tonight. Does, so, if you want to see me with really uh, intricate ice makeup every Monday, because my character's dying from an ice curse right now. Uh, that is so cool. <laughs> so you also do cosplay to a certain degree as well. It, I find that dressing up for my character helps me be them. So like for my St. Pete character, I have a wig. I have a different pair of glasses I wear. Uh a different voice. Uh, she has this egg pillow. <laughs> I love that kind of <laughs> commitment, especially to just the craft, because I do think mm -hmm. of, of role playing as a craft. It is a performance yeah. art. And I love that people, you know, will lean so far into it because it does create an immersive experience, not just for me as a player. Like I usually have different costumes for the different NPCs that I'll play at certain times, uh, mm -hmm. but also you know, for other players as well to have some sort of visual, uh, I but think it helps. Nice. I think it helps. Yeah, I think it helps get them into the scene and into the moment. And so mm -hmm. I think that's fantastic. So starting with D and D, and so this was after the pandemic, or at least a good right. solid chunk into it that you decided to pick it up. What was your first class that you played? Uh, it is the same one. It's uh, I started as a level twelve circle of spores druid. Oh wow, okay. That's uh, that's learn. diving in the deep end too. That's not a, a simple class. No, dude, there's a lot of spells to learn at level twelve. Mm -hmm. And did dude. you have a a difficult time like learning all those mechanics, or did some of the knowledge that you had been taught, even just overhearing it as a kid, kind of stick and allow you to be able to adapt to it quickly? Uh so this was about a hundred sessions into the campaign that I joined and wow, okay. <laughs> I listened to every session leading up to it. So I kind of got a majority of it. There are some weird druid things that I still don't a hundred percent always know, but there's like a lot of overall, mechanics. <laughs> there's so many mechanics, but for the most part, and I've also got the it down that you just ask if you can do a thing and see if they say yes, even if you shouldn't be able to. Yeah, and they'll be able to at least tell you what they require of you to be mm -hmm. able to do that thing. Right. What or made, if they'll just rule cool. <laughs> what made you look into Vampire the Masquerade or World of Darkness? What kind of was the transitioning point there? So that was actually my brother wanted to run a campaign for World of Darkness. And so he has all the books and I was looking at them and we played a singular session where I played a Bruja that immediately on chatting with Cyrus, was like, you know, we really got to take down these cams. Like, <laughs> you are part of this Anarch revolt. Immediately <laughs> Anarch. We, we need to do this. <laughs> and then also Dice Cold related, uh, they were starting up a vampire campaign. And one of my friends on there was like, you should really ask the storyteller if you can hop in because there's a spot open. And I was like, I don't know if I should... Uh, and then I did, and we got through the whole thing. I destroyed every car that I ever drove, <laughs> um, which carried over to this campaign. The only car to the server, the only car I've, Vivian has driven is no longer functional. 
So when you joined the server, you came in as part of a package group of others. Are they also people yeah. who belong to the Dice Cult, or is it just people you've yeah. gathered along the way? Oh, okay. Yeah, it was all of us that had been part of that Dice Cult vampire game. We were all like, we want to play another one. Well, and I was super impressed when you guys came in because you gave like video references. You all came in as a package deal. You had this idea for a coterie all put together on all your characters. And mm -hmm. your character specifically is Vivian Pigeon Flynn. Now, yes. what can you tell me about that character for people who are watching? Vivian is, uh, she's an Alcavian. Uh, she, a lot of it draws on different aspects of myself, like, she loves crafting. I pushed it to an extreme level for her. Uh, she is very scatterbrained, has every job she can think of that to join, uh, has one at the coffee shop, the hospital, the red salon, and is looking for more. Probably would be doing uh, Uber Eats and things like that, but, you know, the car situation is no longer working. <laughs> And what has been, or what was your favorite part of that story? Or was there a favorite moment that you had in that story uh, that you'd like to share? Oh, goodness. For her, she is, hmm. One of the first things she did was stole the entire box of name tags from the coffee shop. Because they're necessary. I need them. Of course. You never know. You never know. And I proceeded to hand them out to people as Amazing. a token of friendship. And Amazing. One of our group members, when they joined, I she, she did not earn a name tag. Ooh, so it wasn't friendship right out the gate. It was there. not friendship. <laughs> it's very very opposing forces. <laughs> so it, if you guys talk to Aurora or Dr. Alex, they both have name tags. Amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> What is a clan that you've been interested in but haven't had the opportunity to play yet and would enjoy playing? I think I would really enjoy trying out the Tremere because okay. I know that there's a lot of different avenues you can go with them. And I really like deep diving into lore. And I know that there's a lot that I can They learn. have a very extensive lore. They yes, have it's... so much going on. I would I would even deign to say that the Tremere, even though they are a controversial clan to say the they least, are. people either love them or they hate them. There's not really a middle ground there. They are mm. also one of the more fleshed out clans, one of the clans that has one of the deepest and richest histories and lores and their wide range of abilities make them very versatile and are very keen to being played by people who like to play casters in D&D &D because of all mm. the magic and rituals and everything they can do. But I do think they are also one of the more complicated clans to play yeah. because there is not just the disciplines and abilities. There's all these rituals and all these other things they can do. Uh, but it is one of the clans that have, has always been one of the more fleshed out clans. Mm -hmm. So when did you, you first heard of World of Darkness because of your friend, because of the yeah. Dice Cult? What about it, how would you compare it to other games that you've played? What do you think of it in, like, what, what appeals to you most about this system specifically? I think it's more, it, because it feels more real, because of the setting it's based in, I can see that, like, ah, uh, this weird thing going on. I can reason, like, oh, where I could see that in real life, these weird gatherings of people and be like, well, I see weird gatherings all the time. I used to live in Chicago. That's strangely normal. And then you throw in this world. It's like, but it's because they're vampires. Yeah, there's just that extra layer that's laid uh -huh. over it. And I think that, uh, and I've talked about this so many times, I see the world differently after playing this mm -hmm. game because I'm just like, oh, those are Malkavians or those are Toreador. Yeah. This is, you know, this would be an Elysium or whatever the case may exactly. be. Exactly. So you came in as a hospital coterie. Where did the idea to have this coterie based around a hospital come from? What was What was the motivation behind that? Because I thought that was so fascinating and interesting that that was like, the direction you guys knew you wanted to go from the get-go? It was a lot of what the 
uh, venture characters were interested in. They wanted something where it made sense for all of us to be able to be there. Okay. So uh, a hospital is a place where it makes sense for, well, technically Vivian is also a nurse. I forgot that. <laughs> it's one of the many, the list, <laughs> the of resume her. of jobs. She's got a lot going on. So but... technically she had two jobs in the hospital. <laughs> Let's be specific. Uh, and then we had somebody who did more admin and we had priest work <laughs> And it was just a, it's a place where you could have a lot of different things going on and it's very central. Well, and I think that's such a cool idea that you already, you, you saved the storyteller so much work because one mm -hmm. of the biggest things about being a storyteller is like, how do I bring all these people together? Like what, what's going to be yeah. the connective tissue to bring the group together? And you guys were like, we're, we're, here we go. We already have it. We've already thought of that. <laughs> We already fleshed that all out. We've got the the relationships defined and mm -hmm. put together. I think that is so cool. Have you ever thought about storytelling yourself? Have you ever had any interest or any desire to be a storyteller? I waffle on it. Like I think that it would be fun, but also I'm one of those people that would want to have every single thing prepared possible, and I know that's not possible as a storyteller at all. And mm -hmm. so I'd have to make myself sit there and learn that I can't prepare and that I have to be able to do things on the fly and it's just going to be the case immediately. Oh, absolutely. No, all the preparation in the world can't get you yeah, ready for not. one decision one player makes can completely throw an yeah. entire, you know, section of it out the window. Have you ever run any games, not just Vampire the Masquerade, but like any games whatsoever, D&D, &D, nothing? I, I have not. Okay, okay. But I'd be interested. I'd be interested to see your take on, you know, running a game and what kind of style game you would want to run. Uh, have you explored any of the other World of Darkness material, like Werewolf, Mage, Wraith, Changeling, anything like that? Or are any of those, do any of those appeal to you outside of Vampire? Uh, I haven't read any official books. I've done a lot of just random reading the wikis. So... I know small bits and things. I think I'd mostly want to learn more about Hunter. Okay. Now, just go the complete opposite end. Yeah. Well, and I think Hunter is also a great, it's very accessible because it's something mm -hmm. we can all relate to if you're a fan of Supernatural or Buffy the Vampire yeah. Slayer or anything like that. But also, they're humans. And that's something yeah. that we can also relate to because that's the obviously the closest thing to what we are is is it's it's humans and the idea of monster hunting uh always provides interesting adventures that you can go on whereas like we're never mm -hmm. for the most part most of us are never going to know what it is to be a vampire or a werewolf or anything like that but a hunter you can put yourself in that mindset and really build a character based off that's grounded and based off of reality in that mm -hmm. as well so talking more about the dice making were you into any other artistic hobbies growing up? Was were, Did you always oh, consider yeah. yourself to be very artsy and, like, really into crafting? Yeah, for sure. Uh, very much was one of the people that would uh, start any kind of craft. Have not finished many. But I used to draw a lot when I was younger. Like, I had all the really fancy colored pencils, took art classes in high school, and... Uh, I have a, like, 30-plus page cross-stitch in the other room I've been working on for way too long. Uh, i knitting. All the so, things. So how do you get started getting into dice making? Because I totally understand, like, seeing other people's products and being very interested in it. But how did you mm -hmm. actually get into the process of making dice? And where do you, where do you kind of start with something like that? Because... From everything I've heard, mm -hmm. you need certain equipment, you need materials and chemicals and all this kind of extra stuff. So where, what was your starting point? How did you really get into it? So learning what I needed, there's uh, this, I don't know if I'd call him a dice maker anymore because he's slowed down, but a guy named The Ribonator on YouTube who did a ton of tutorials and shared everything that he used to make dice. And so I looked into that and immediately was like, okay, this is the list of things that I need to order. 
and got uh, packs of nitrile gloves, which was really hard at the time because it was during the pandemic and you could not get them. Oh, for sure. For sure. It was, it was a choice. There's actually a thing called like uh, rubber gloves. or so. It's like almost a lotion that you put on. It's terrible. And I will never touch that again. It technically works, but I don't recommend it. So I had to get those. Uh, you need obviously the resin to pour it. And I went through many brands before I found one that I actually liked because they're all different. And get um, I needed to get a table space for it. So I just started with a tiny two foot table that was my entire area for a while. Um, silicone to make my own molds. I reached out to a person that specialized in 3D printing master dice and picked out a font made my logo and i also have the dice cult logo on another set of dice and then from there had to get those sand and polish those which is a whole nother mess uh <laughs> learning to sand and polish so you need specialty papers i use that are called zona papers they're like six different colors they go from grits that are like oh three thousand microns down to one micron Wow. So I want to show off some of your work here while we're talking. Yeah. Uh, But it seems like it'd be a very expensive hobby to get into, let alone to make it a profession. Uh, Were you able to test out the process first or did you just kind of leap in head first and say, well, it's I'm going to sink the money into it anyway. I might as well go full in. Or did you were uh, you able to work with some stuff first before committing to it? I went full in. (laughs) Okay, so you bought I, all the stuff you need right I out the gate. I everything immediately. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I know that there's a lot of trial and error. Like, uh, yes. I remember having done TikTok Lives with Wolfpack Dice, and he had a huge, mm-hmm. big bucket full of duds of just trials oh, yeah. that he had run through and that just didn't work out, and he ended up having to I have to a bag dump. over there. That's my duds. <laughs> So how many sets, or what was your first set like? What did you feel about your first set? Uh, oh, actually, my first set was not with the masters that I currently use. I bought different masters from somebody else that were really bad quality. And so those were very chunky. I thought they were beautiful at the time. Um, they were very simple, white and black, pour with a little bit of red uh, foil in them. And... I still like them. Well, you got you got to love them that the first ones you created, like even they're if they're the not as perfect ones. as you thought they'd be, like they're the first <laughs> and they started this this crazy road you've gone down mm-hmm. since. So, you've also gotten to the point now that you travel to conventions yes. to to be a vendor to sell these dice. How many conventions have you been to so far and what would you say is your favorite? Oh, geez. Um, you know what? I actually have that information right in front of me because I sure. have Google Drive in yeah. front of me. My conventions tab. So I've done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. What? Sorry. In 2022, I did six. Last year, I did eight. This year, so far, I'm scheduled for six. Wow. That's, Two that have already happened. That's amazing, yeah. especially since you really only got into this at during the pandemic, but you're already yeah. traveling, you're already selling oh, yeah. dice sets. What is the furthest you've traveled so far because of dice? Like, what's the furthest convention you've been to? Uh, My furthest ones have been down in Atlanta, so I'm based in central Illinois, so it's like a 10-ish hour drive for me. Oh, wow. So And you drove all the way to Atlanta. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Which convention was that? Uh, They have one called Southern Fried Gaming Expo that I've done twice, and Momocon that I'm going to have done twice in a couple weeks. (laughs) Oh, that's that's incredible. And we were talking before we went live, and you said you have, like, back-to-back conventions coming up here which conventions are though where where can people see you uh over the Uh, next few weeks 
Yeah, so this coming weekend, the 17th through 19th, I'll be at Anime Central, which is in Rosemont, Chicago. And then the following weekend, the 24th through 27th, I will be down in Atlanta for MomoCon. Oh, wow. So That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. It's going to be a lot, but... And what's the average time it takes to make a set of dice? Going from the very, very beginning to, you know, designing a concept or coming mm -hmm. up with an idea to executing it, to it being completely finished and ready to sell or ship. How long does that take for, let's just say, a single set of dice? So I don't know active work time. What I do is I work in bigger batches to save my hands and shoulders so that I can function as a human. That makes uh, sense. So it takes me about a month to get a set done. Okay. But you get yeah. several sets done at the same yeah. time. So you're just going yes. through the process with all of them rather mm -hmm. than just working on a single set from the beginning to the yeah. end. It's okay. Well, that seems like a smart way to do it, to mass produce them. Uh, what Take us through the process step by step. I think a lot of people are fascinated how the sausage gets made mm. in this case, myself included, because there's a lot of balancing and chemistry work that's involved. And, you know, you have to put it in, I think a pressurizer. I, I don't even know yes. what this, but let's go through the entire process because it's it's yeah. just absolutely incredible to me. So do we want a regular set of dice or a more uh, inclusive one, like with my blank sets that are more detailed? Let's uh, let's go with a regular set of dice to regular start and then we can hear what additional steps go into the uh, got more specific. It, got it. So something like the one I'm giving away today. What I would do is I sit down, I think about, okay, what colors do I want to mess with? Pick. Sometimes I'll take them out ahead of time, sometimes I won't, because art is chaos in general. It really is, yeah. So I typically have all of my molds sitting out already, because that's just where they live until they are no longer functional. Uh, I'll pull those out. I usually mix up about a cup worth of resin at a time, eight ounces, depends. Uh, what I do is it's a two-part epoxy, so you have to pour half and half, making sure it's very specifically the correct amount or it will not cure properly. And you will have uh, toxic dice that have to go in the trash and you never yeah. touch them again. And after mixing it up, takes about five minutes of stirring and you... Usually what I do is I have Spotify on and I will listen to two songs okay. at least to make sure that things are fully mixed. And then I also transfer it to a second cup to make sure it's even more fully mixed because sometimes there will be stuff stuck on the cup that is not actually mixed in properly. And I switch out to a new stirring utensil because uncured resin, unmixed up, just double checking. And then from there, you separate the resin into different cups or whatever you need to mix those different colors up. Uh, for those dice, I believe I did clear on the base, and then I had a cup of blue and one of white using what are called alcohol inks. So they're more translucent, but they, they work. Uh, and the white specifically is a bit heavier of a pigment than the different translucent colors. So what I did was I used a pipette to swirl in that white after I'd already poured in the blue and the clear to create the different patterns. Then, after you have them poured into the mold, you have to put the caps on after you let it sit for a while because you have to let the bubbles rise up, otherwise you're going to have probably massive voids, which still happens no matter how hard I try. And then it goes into a pressure pot for 24 hours. So it's basically this big metal thing that sits on my floor. And I also have an air compressor that's next to me right now that takes up a lot of space. And it gets pressurized to about 30 PSI and just sits there and waits. And then you unmold them and pray that it all turned out okay. And it has a really thin layer of resin usually across the whole mold that you have to remove. Usually I do tape because it's really messy. If I don't do tape, sometimes I just kind of fling it on the floor because it's a mess in here anyway. <laughs> might but, as well. It's your workshop. Might as well. I'm going to have to vacuum sometime. Right. It, it'll get cleaned up. Then after that, it, I usually leave dice 
about a week before I'll sand and polish them just okay. to make sure they have the time to fully harden. Because depending on what you put in them, the hardening time can change. Like alcohol inks, because of what they're made of, can make it take a little longer. Same thing if you use like acrylic paint or anything with any kind of water in it, it makes it take longer. So I just leave it in there. I have a huge backlog, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, That's fair. <laughs> I think I have about 50 sets over there right now that are completely untouched. Wow. So you've yeah. always you've always got steps that you can be further progressing yes. on or projects in motion. Constantly. But that also means you always have a supply as well. You're never finding yourself without oh, yeah. enough ready to go or at least close enough to ready to go mm -hmm. to do it. So the sanding and polishing part is the part yes. that I find to be... Most people that I've talked to, most dice makers, I've said that seems to be the most tedious, but also one of the more physically straining parts of the project. How long does it say to take to, to sand and polish a single die, just one of the entire set? It really wouldn't take that long. The It depends on how many faces that you have to sand. So, for example, uh, the D20, the way that I make my molds, I use what are called cap molds. So there's only one die, face of the die that is really that bad usually. And then you also want the ones that are surrounding it. So the D20s, I'm usually doing four, but sometimes up to 10 faces. Yeah. So it can take a little bit of time or a lot. I, over time, have switched to a mixture for sanding. So I guess there's six papers that you can go through. I now only do four. What I okay. do is there's the first three are rougher, and I do all three of those completely by hand. And then I have what are called vibratory tumblers, which people actually use to clean like brass. And I have this wood media and specific polish that I use, and I put them in there for a little while, and it'll do a couple of papers worth of polishing for me. Then I have to do a different step that other people don't have to do of cleaning out all the polish from the numbers. They get completely filled and that's something but <laughs> and then after that i do after i have fully inked them i do another round of polishing by hand on that last grid of paper just to give it a final shine up but it it is the most taxing part like i will sit in here for hours and my hand and my shoulder will be aching. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, just the repeated, like the, the repeat, repeat repetitive emotion. project and like having yeah. to put a certain amount of pressure on where you don't want too much or too little. It's mm -hmm. got to be so tense, you know, in your arm and your shoulder to it be is. able to do that for as long as you need to do it, for as many sets as you need to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite set of dice that you've made so far? Oh, goodness. I have a few. Usually they're all character sets that are my, like, mm, my favorite favorites. Um, what does you made for your character specifically? Yeah, I actually, hmm, wonder if they'll show up. But this one has a little bit, uh, what I do sometimes when I make dice is I will save that thin layer of resin that's on top of the mold if it's a fun color. And I actually have bags full of them to use later in the dice <laughs> themselves so this one actually has a little bit of blue a little bit of black oh yeah and then it has a little bit of silver ribbon in it and yep. some like green mesh oh, that's and incredible. that's my favorite that i've made for myself but my actual favorite set of dice i think is i did a platinum colored set that i drilled into uh, this is using blanks so i drilled into those and then i wrapped chain around them okay like a gold chain so right it, and then encased that in the resin with the ink numbers it's they're so pretty that's so incredible that is so cool and I know that there are different sizes of dice that people make. Yes. For example, there's those teeny tiny mini ones. And then I've yes. seen gigantic, <laughs> like almost the size of a softball sized dice before. Do you usually stick with a standard size or have you tried experimenting with the various sizes before? I mostly have the standards. Okay. Um, 
I have a 30 millimeter D20 that I've had for a little bit now that I've done a few different things with. And about a week and a half ago, something like that, I just got a 60 millimeter, which is a little bit smaller than a baseball, and a set of miniature dice that range from 12 millimeters down to eight. So I have them coming. <laughs> so there are a lot of techniques that I've seen yes. done where I've seen like they'll place... Like you were talking about the chain, wrapping the chain and then mm -hmm. embedding that in resin, resin. Is there a technique that you you want to learn that you haven't had the opportunity to experiment with? Or do you have like a dream technique that you're working up towards? Or have you pretty much experimented in all the styles that you want to experiment in? There are definitely ones I want to figure out. Uh, there's one where people with, with these blanks will use... UV resin and soap bubbles to create what kind of re represents dragon scales around the dice. I haven't figured out how to do it quite yet. Also, everyone always asks about liquid cores, and I despise making them. I've tried it a few times. I would love to figure it out so that I can actually provide these to people, but it's so difficult, and they're prone to breaking, and it's a whole thing. Do you if have? Magically... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. If I could magically figure that out, it'd be great. <laughs> Do you have any advice for people who are looking to prolong the life of their dice or to upkeep their dice? Because I know that dice do mm -hmm. get wear and tear. You know, the edges get worn down, and it can yeah adjust the way they roll to certain degrees. Do you have any suggestions for anybody who might not be looking into getting into dice making, but also might be looking mm -hmm. to like? upkeep their dice or keep their dice healthy so to speak yeah so depends on what dice you're getting of course uh resin dice are fairly durable uh i roll mine in a velvet tray just to be safe but like, that's the main thing i think to keep them in as pristine condition as possible with rolling uh in general for design wise to keep them as pristine as possible you want to keep them out of prolonged sun exposure okay because so sun exposure resin... can bleach them or melt them to a certain degree i have not seen one melt uh <laughs> but it can change the colors okay <laughs> very dramatically so it'll yeah it'll cause discoloration in the dice itself yeah there in the sun i too. when i moved to where i am now i tried to do the farmer's market here for a bit in october specifically it was not even full summer right. and set up and there were sets that were very bright pink and they turned into a very pale pink by the end of one day and i was like oh no this is not going to work out anymore <laughs> so i only do indoor events <laughs> st petersburg by night is brought to you through collaborations with our partnered vendors Wolfpack Dice, Ember Fox Dice, Dragon Ink Dice, Bear of the Bard, Champs Tramps, Penshi Artista, and Chromatic Creations. Links to our partnered vendors, as well as our Twitch and YouTube channels, can be found on our website, stpetebynight.com. The official theme song for St. Petersburg by Night is Vampire by Faith and Failure. You could find them at faithandfailure.com. You can follow St. Pete by Night on all socials with the hashtag St. Pete by Night. If you wish to support our program, you can do so at coffee.com slash St. Pete by Night to help keep the stories rolling. Are there it's any materials that you'd want to work with that you haven't had the opportunity to work with yet? Um, I'd like to try using a uh, snake shed. Okay. I don't have a snake, so I don't have any. Okay. That, it looks yeah. really cool. That's, that's very cool. So when someone is getting into this process or wants to mm -hmm. try and try their hand at dice making and like we were talking about it can be a very expensive hobby or a very yes. expensive craft how much is a person who is wanting to get started in this looking to spend to make an honest go of it 
at at startup, you know, with just basic level materials, and it can be a ballpark right. estimate, but basic materials, how much would you think someone would have to spend to actually try an honest go at this? Uh, as just a hobby, it's a lot easier. Okay. Uh, because you don't have to pay for good masters. Um, it can be fairly cheap. So let's see. Safety equipment. Respirator costs like $50, I want to say. So there's that. You're wearing a respirator. I don't care if it's a hobby. Keep your lungs safe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then yeah, because the there's gloves. fumes and stuff throughout that process, too. Yeah. yeah. Even if you can't smell them, don't trust what the bottle says. It says it's non-toxic. That's cure when it's that's true when it's fully cured. Not true when it's still liquid. Oh wow, okay. Uh-huh. They're sneaky. Okay. Go on about safety forever. <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, so let's put let's say gloves. You need a box of those. That's probably another twenty bucks of so seventy. Uh Resin in general, you can get a small bottle, like a 16 ounce bottle to start, which be around $20 on Amazon. So, 100. Uh, any colorants, you can get a basic pack for another 15. So, 115. Cups, probably another 10. So, I'm going to say like, Probably two hundred at least to start because okay, you're gonna need like to buy bare molds. minimum, very basic yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's without being able to do the pressure pot. You're gonna have to deal with the bubble mess. Oh wow! And how much does a pressure want. pot usually run? Uh, depends on if you want it to the one that works out of the box or not. I started with the ones that don't, which are cheaper. Uh, that. Probably about $150, but you have to spend the time to modify it right. from being a paint pressure <laughs> riser to being just a pressure pot. Plus, you also need an air compressor, which is another chunk of change. Uh, my current pressure pot, which works much better, was around $250, and I think around the same for this air compressor. Yeah, so, so it's, it's it's an investment. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be an investment. Yeah, that's incredible. So what made you decide to take this professional? What made you decide to change from a hobby or something that you were just interested in to making it into a business? Because that, that takes a lot of courage, first off, because, you know, there's rejection in a lot of things and there's, you know, a lot of expense that comes with it. What made you decide to take the leap and, and go the professional route? Uh, I think part of it was because of the timing. Uh, with the pandemic happening, I was I didn't have anything else I was working on at the time. Right. And so it was a, I'm going to just try to do this as a job immediately. I There was no time where I was like, this is just going to be a hobby. It was immediately, how can I make these the best that I can? And so you went right into making it a trade and a career and at a business. Yeah. Uh, that's that's incredible. Like, I don't I don't think I'd ever have the confidence to just be like, yeah, I'm going to try this thing I've never done before and invest into it fully mm -hmm. as a business. That's that's absolutely amazing. Did you have any desires growing up to run your own business? Was that something that you were always kind of looking out for? Or was it just this specific thing that, that pushed you into that? You know, the only thing I can think of is I thought a lot when I was younger about running a combination bookstore cat cafe. Never thought it would be a real thing. But that's <laughs> so. Yeah. Everybody um, has that. I think they yeah. have their own dream of like owning some sort of brick and mortar shop. And I think it's yeah. it's just time that has taught us that no, brick and mortar is expensive. Online's the way to it go. It is and expensive. With I can rent ask constantly and, if I oh have one. Yeah, that's that's just yeah. It's it's incredible that you had that level of confidence to do it. How many sets of dice would you sell say you sell in a given year? on average gosh probably around a hundred total wow at, okay. at the moment it, it really depends on the events that i get into because i'm really bad at social media 
I don't know why if I go to post something, it takes me a solid 20 minutes to come up with a single sentence right. to write, to post with it. So I just avoid it. It's <laughs> not the thing to do. Uh, I used to sell a lot of sets because I was streaming my work. And so people would see stuff as I was working on it and they'd be like, I want that one. Oh, and, I think that that's such a cool idea, though. And, and I definitely yeah. something I would encourage you to keep doing because the process is just so fascinating to me, not just the finished product, which is so cool. But because of shows like How It's Made that used mm -hmm. to be on where you find out how a doorknob is made or anything like that. I just yeah. love seeing it broken down into a step by step process. And I think that's become more and more of a popular thing, you know, mm -hmm. over the past decade or so is just people are very interested in that whole oh, yeah. process from start to finish. Uh, how what's the most number of dice that you've made at a single time? So the most amount of oh. actively going batches you've had at once. Um, I actually I think that I know the most dice I've poured at once was around I think it was a hundred because I did a specific stream where I was like, I'm pouring a, a single die per follower I have. And so that was a lot of dice at once, but that was also when I had four pressure pots. And so it was a little easier to uh, do that. Yeah. But active dice overall that I have at once, I could not even tell you how many are in this room right now. Um, I counted before we started that I have 127 sets fully finished. Wow. So yeah, you've got a, <laughs> a full stock currently of, of sets yes. of dice just ready to go. That's absolutely unbelievable. Just absolutely incredible. And so I want to point people towards your website. Uh, Dragon Ink Dice can be found on Big Cartel at dragoninkdice.bigcartel.com. And there are some really, really gorgeous sets of dice on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am trying so hard not to just go buy them all up because they are so absolutely pretty. But if you want to order some of those sets, just head on over to that website. It's very easy to go through the whole process. Uh, and there are a lot of options there. But also, as a reminder... We are doing a giveaway tonight. That set of dice, that set of VTM World of Darkness dice that you see on screen right now is available as a giveaway. Uh, just because of tonight's stream, uh, Katie has been so generous to offer up one of these sets to one of our followers. All you have to do is put hashtag dice me please as it is on the screen there. That's dice me plz into the chat and you can be in the running to win one of those sets of dice tonight. But I definitely encourage everybody to head over and look at some of the other options as well, because there's full D&D mm. sets, there's BTM sets, there's just every kind of set of dice that you can imagine, and they are so absolutely gorgeous. And I can say for sure that we have a lot of dice goblins in this community who just hoard and collect dice. Do you consider yourself a dice goblin, a hoarder or collector of dice, or is it more just... You have a set of dice, you like that set of dice, you stick with it. Because I've never considered myself one, but I'm starting to get the appeal the more and more beautiful sets that I see. Mm. Uh, I am both. because So I only use so many of them, but I consider all of the ones that are made to be mine, and I'm allowed to use them until someone adopts them. Okay, okay. Yeah, so you, you, you'll use a set of dice that you have ready to sell, but you'll use them just to... Just to feel them out before selling them off sometimes. to somebody else sometimes. Yeah, okay. Like, our last vampire session, I, I, can't, I get yelled at because I roll so badly all the time. The amount of bestial failures or messy crits that I get is insane. So I got told that I had to use different hunger dice. So That's I fair. Took so, I took some <laughs> to test. That's they amazing. all still rolled badly for me but it's fine <laughs> it, it's it is fine and honestly failure on the dice is what makes the game fun for me if you had guaranteed success all the time it just wouldn't be nearly as appealing as that possibility of failure like because it creates yeah. some of the most unique and interesting situations uh and i love 
the element of dice being used in role playing because of the randomity it can cause, the random situations that can come about because of it, and it just wouldn't be the same experience without it. Do you have any superstitions or traditions when it comes to dice in gaming? Uh, you know, I know some people will go through rituals with their dice, or they'll they'll put their dice in salt to take out the bad energy, and you know, before they have a game session or whatever the case is. Do you have any kind of interesting or unique rituals or traditions that you do with your dice? Uh, I think the most that I do is I have them all laid out, and I will roll them all first to see which ones are behaving for the night. And those ones get to be rolled first before anyone else gets to be considered. So okay. they, they go in they go in a line of best to worst. Best to worst. So you have to start yes. at one end and see how they're doing yes. all the way down into that's mm-hmm. amazing. <laughs> have you ever put dice in dice jail? Because I, I think this concept is hilarious, but also so unique and interesting that people will put certain yes. dice in timeout. Uh what is your it process of going it. through that? Um if it rolls, so for D D dice, if it get more than one I roll one more than once in a session. That die is dead to me for a week. <laughs> it's, it's you just will to not me. touch it until at least a it week. It gets is ignored. Fast. Now, if <laughs> if it is dice that I've made, so I do singles as well for my events, and I'll sit there and I'll roll them at the table, and if I find one that's behaving like that, I threaten to turn it into jewelry. Amazing! Amazing! Yep. So have you have you done that before? Have you ended up going that far and turning dice into jewelry before? I, I do make dice jewelry. They're usually made of the ones that aren't uh, what I consider sellable because of okay. probably something that nobody else would notice other than me. Uh, well, th- that's a good way to upcycle it too. Honestly, like yeah, that's that's a great way upcycle. to make use of it because you have you have all these disposable dice that might not have turned out the way you wanted to, but it's good to find another purpose for them rather than just turning them into trash. I also put them into, now that I have the 60 millimeter, I am putting them into that die as upcycling as well. So we actually have a new follower, uh, Greg Zor, who said in the chat that you Uh, made some (laughs) awesome soup dice for them. Now I need to hear about this. I need Uh, to understand this. Greg's dice are the bane of my existence, and he knows it. (laughs) What was the process for making these? Because dice full of soup, that just asks or prompts so many further questions. That set of dice, it's the first ones I was required to use blanks on because of how many times it failed in the process of making them. What I did was I got an actual packet of ramen out of my kitchen, and I took some of the noodles, I took some seasonings out of my kitchen, I used the actual seasoning from the ramen and mixed that into the resin with and added a teensy bit of orange. I think I had three failed sets before I finally was able to get one with the blanks to work. That's they're they're beautiful, but they made me really mad. <laughs> but you stuck to it and I think that's I did. something that I admire about this craft and this art is that you won't just say, okay, it can't be done just because one goes oh, bad. No. Like you have to almost push through and push past all of those failures to to keep innovating and to keep going forward what do you do what encourages you to keep that kind of energy going like what is what's your motivator to see a project through like that rather than just trying it and giving up on it uh, part of it i just like seeing if i can do certain things and also i like making people happy with art i, I like giving people gifts this yes this one was a gift i was trying to remember And it's always been something that I've really liked doing is gifting things. And this specifically, it was a, I had to do it. And I was actually on a timeline because this was a, I wanted to bring them to Momocon to hand them in person. So it was a rushed thing. Uh, I learned in the process of that, that bacon bits cause cure inhibition. 
<laughs> I cannot use bacon bits. I am sorry, everybody. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, that's that's interesting to know because, like, mm-hmm. there is a chemistry to it. Like, there's so many there chemicals is. involved and so many things you have to consider that I wouldn't even think of, like, the cross contamination between something I, like bacon bits and curing. I don't know why. It's not like they aren't dried bacon, but I I don't control the science. In regards to the soup dice, which I'm never going to believe I've said those words, and I'm now never going to not be able to think about them, do you remember what flavor of ramen it was? Uh, It was original. Okay. Original chicken, yeah. Would you say that is the wildest set that you've made, like the most experimental set that you've made, or was there something that beat it? Probably that one, because that one also had a companion die of my first D30, which I had a handcrafted uh, silver pot that I also put little soup pieces into and like, cured with UV resin. The The UV resin does make the bacon bits not cause cure inhibition. Interesting. So, that... so if it's encased in UV resin, it's safe. That's, so one resin doesn't work, but then the mm-hmm. UV resin specifically does work. Yes. That's crazy now another thing that i've been curious about is masters because i've heard that term tossed around before what is a master and it sounds like it's something that has to be outsourced something that you have to order so who do you go to for masters and what actually is a master so you could do it yourself if you are good at 3d printing shapes that have to be very specifically shaped right uh, I personally use, I've used a couple different people. The first one, we don't talk anymore. But he's been excommunicated from the dice making community, so he doesn't exist. Fair. Uh, but I work with uh, one group called Revel Broker. They use what's called a Form Labs 3. I believe they use what's called dental grade resin to be able to print out. It essentially looks like your regular dye, but with like a clear resin. Right. And it has the numbers already in it. Uh, it has, if you have a logo, it'll have that in the right spot on it. And they have to go through the whole process of placing everything using 3D programming and putting, you know, lines of supports on it in very specific places to make sure the numbers do not melt into themselves. And you can get masters of all the dice shapes. I actually have a 30-sided one. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. And you can get basically any any shape, any combination anything. you want. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. I've also seen, like, spiky dice, where it's, like, the long, almost, mm-hmm. like, caltrop-looking yeah. dice. They're, they're, they're usually, like, called shards or crystal dice. Oh, that's... I do not have any of those yet. No, that's... Maybe in yeah, the future. That's... I have seen those before, and I think that they're very, very cool. What is the dangerous, the most dangerous element in the dice making process? Because we've talked about fumes. I know that skin contact with resin, mm-hmm. especially in certain points, is very dangerous. What would you say is the most dangerous process, and what's the best way to be safe and preventative about it? Those are probably the biggest overarching ones, the fumes and making sure that you don't have any skin contact with the resin. Uh, If you do end up getting resin on you that's uncured, I always keep a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and immediately just kind of pour it on myself and get a paper towel. And then I also go wash my arm or whatever if it happens. Uh, Have you experienced any injuries because of the dice making process? And what would you say is your worst injury you've sustained? Uh, it, of course, is because of the Caltrop D4s. Uh, when sanding those by hand, they become actual weapons. I have cut my hand sanding them before because of how sharp those corners and edges can get. Because of the tumbling process I use for part of it, it cuts down on that. So it's not as dangerous when you people get it. Ugh. But... They are weapons. Oh, I bet. Especially when they've got the, just those really rigid, pointy edges. 
Like the D4s, that's what I always think of when I think of like people stepping on dice. That's where my brain goes to immediately. It's never D6s or any other shape. It's, it's always the D4s. And that just, ugh. They're ugh. also the only ones I only I ever drop. They're the only dice I ever manage to drop in this room. And then I'm afraid for my feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got to be I especially shuffle. careful at that point. Because they're also one of the smallest combination of dice. So they could be buried in carpets. Yes. They could just disappear. And you're going to find them only through stepping on them. Luckily, what is... there's, uh, the carpet is not accessible in here because I have a tarp across the floor. That's smart. That's 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 yeah. a good tip yeah. for anybody is to make yeah. sure that you don't get have a carpet. Drop, get a paint drop cloth, put it on your floor, and never move it. Tape it down. <laughs> Do you have a favorite dice type or shape? So like a D20 versus Ooh. a D4. Like, Do you have a specific one that you like more than any others? I really like... I don't have them. The... There's a specific kind of D12 where it's more of diamond shape. It's like a rhombic D12. They're beautiful. I love them. I want one. Okay. Okay. Is there a favorite one that you like to work on? Like one that you think is the easiest or the most fun or the most interesting? Because a lot of them seem similar in their shape, but they are a variety of shapes. Is there one that you like more than any other? The easiest to work on are the D6s just because... The sanding is just so smooth. It's the easiest to hold. Um, My favorite to make, though, is I actually have a couple alternate D4 shapes, and I find them so fun. One's like this tapered crystal shape. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like it. Then that never like falls on its side to the point that you can't get to the numbers. Like it's it's always yeah. Okay. You can always see the number. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. And it actually rolls because it doesn't just land like the caltrops do. No, no, that's yeah, that's so what? Okay, the inking. I don't mm. have a steady hand, so I've never been super <laughs> good at painting minis or anything like that. What is Me the either. inking process like and how much focus like do you have to use a magnifying glass like how do you go through all that or are you able to just ink it in and then just wipe off the excess and that one it... okay oh well, see, that, I, that's I, such I a just, relief <laughs> i slather it on there and then i wipe it off on a paper towel and then once it's dry i will clean it with that last polishing paper yeah that oh my god if you had to do it it's so, so much easier that seems like the best now, way to do it because i couldn't imagine like Having to paint with inside those little lines. Absolutely not. Do you have but, a specific brush that you use for it? Or are you do you like uh, literally slather and wipe? I have, let's see, what size is this? This is a five slash zero. Okay. It's the one I use. Small. Yeah. So um, No, yeah, go ahead. We're gonna say something. I was gonna say. The most intense inking I've done is multicolored inking. You have to do a little more effort with that. What I I still do the same process. I just pull out as many paintbrushes as I do colors, and I'll just slap the colors on, and then I wipe it off in like the direction, like sideways, to make sure all three colors are still there. Oh, wow, yeah, but that that seems fun. like it would be very very specific. It is <laughs> a lot of detail. What is your favorite part of the whole process? Like, is there a certain step that you look forward to most more than others? Or is it just kind of the overall art that you enjoy? Probably the most exciting part is unmolding them because you get to see how they come out. This resin acts really weird and things will change while it's curing because the way they cure is it heats up and it can make things move around in ways you wouldn't expect sometimes so that's that's always fun to see how they come out and do you have to worry about any things like how the pressure like the pressure pot sits or is there any issues like bumping into it might throw everything off like is there anything anybody needs to be aware of if they were to start this process of like you know you want to make sure it's in a stable flat surface or does any of that stuff can not really matter after that point uh Usually people prefer if you have it on a level surface. Uh, I've learned mine's not perfectly level, 
but because that's where my molds were made as well it doesn't really affect it because it's it's level four that room but I'm you probably want that like this pressure pot's pretty heavy if you bump into it you're probably the one getting injured uh it's most likely not moving without a lot of force that makes sense that makes yeah. sense what is the difference between the molds and the masters so the masters are the physical dice okay. themselves the molds are like ugh. everything's right here are these so okay yeah, little cat mold Oh, okay. Interesting. So, originally, like, I made this half first, it goes this way, and then you make the lid on top of it. Oh, wow. Okay. And that you said the masters are the physical dice themselves, so what do you mean yes. by that, then? So, it'd be like this die is what a master looks like. Okay. And do you put those into the molds to, like, make sure that they're the way you want the mold to be, or how does that work? So, for the mold making itself, I have silicone that I have to mix and cure in the same way that I do resin. So, I have to mix the two different parts for making a mold. So, for this D12, for example, I put a face down that I want to be the topmost face on my mold. I put it down on usually just packing tape. And I have those little cups those mouthwash cups are my mold housing. Uh, I cut off the bottom of them and stick it on the tape and hot glue it down and then pour the silicone into that. And then it goes into the pressure pot for six hours. That's how okay. long my silicone takes to cure. And then you take that out and it'll only be that bottom half. It won't have that lid yet. And so what I will then do is I will take it out of the cup. You have to cut keys into it. So these little indents. Yeah. And then uh, I had to cover this entire area with uh, petroleum jelly so that this lid does not stick to it. Right. And then you like build a wall. I usually just use the tape again to build the wall for the lid. And you pour more silicone, let that cure. And then you can take that master out of here and it'll work as a mold to pour the actual dice. Having, I would say, mastered dice making. Uh, has that encouraged you to try any other creative pursuits? Are there any other creative endeavors that you're currently looking into doing? Are you happy with dice making? Or is there some other stuff that you'd also like to get into branching off from this? Uh, I'm pretty happy doing this. I, I think, if anything, it I've started looking into uh, different things I can learn how to do to be able to put them into the dice. Like, I've made a few things out of clay, but I'm not great at it. Okay. I've made that singular pot that was okay. I'm pretty decent at making roses, I want to say. Like, make those a lot. I learned how to do that in college, uh, weirdly enough. Or I actually shared a picture of the duck that I made with the little hat Yeah. on the server. So that's as far as I've gotten with my clay skills. And I'd like to learn to do more just to be able to make different things to go inside them. But also with clay, there's also the, you know, the weight issue. So right. they're probably not the most balanced dice <laughs> when they have the clay inclusions in them, but it's fine. Well, and I've seen people get into metal working to the point that they make like these metal framed dice as well. And it just seems like there's always new evolutions to be found i've seen clockwork dice i've seen all kinds of things oh, yeah is that something that you think you'd be interested in exploring learning how to do that or is there any dice ma makers that you are taking cues from or that you you know specifically watch because you can mm -hmm. learn certain techniques from them there are different dice makers i definitely admire like, there's some amazing things out there. Uh, metal work, I'd love to learn how to do. I don't have a space for that right now. I'm in an apartment. Right. I don't think my landlords would really appreciate it <laughs> if I had anything like that in, in here. Uh, but it would be fun. I will say I do make bismuth crystals, so I do have molten metal in this apartment. Okay. On a regular basis, but... <laughs> That's interesting. Well, for those who want to follow along with what Katie is doing and see the different projects that are coming out, you can go follow Katie on Instagram 
at Instagram.com slash dragon underscore ink underscore dice. So I definitely think it's a worthwhile follow. I know you also have a TikTok because I tagged it when I did the announcement I, for I this. I do. I just haven't posted any videos on it. I I just like videos on there. That's fair. That's fair. But you can definitely go follow on Instagram. Yeah. And you can go support her shop, as we've talked about before, uh, at dragoninkdice.bigcartel.com, where you can order uh, a special set of your very own. Now, do you take custom commissions as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you For can sure. actually get dice designed in any style you would like as My well. My favorite thing. Well, there you go. So if you want your own personal and you want it to be Katie's favorite thing, you should get in touch with her about getting a custom set made. That being said, we have our giveaway tonight uh, sponsored by Dragon Ink Dice. Katie has been generous enough to donate those dice you see on screen right there in our giveaway tonight. All you have to do is put in the hashtag Dice Me Please. And I think we're getting to a point that we could do that giveaway in just a moment here but i'm going to ask you another question before we do that giveaway where did the name come from what what was the motivation or the inspiration to use the name dragon ink dice is there a story behind that a little bit uh for one the logo is my cat in dragon form just so everyone's informed of i who love he that is. i love that <laughs> Uh, so my actual, the logo that I have on the Discord with the little pencil was my original logo because I was going to, I went to college originally for music and then moved on to writing, it, just an English degree with a, a minor in publishing and editing. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And so I was like, I like dragons. And it was going to be a dragon ink, like editing or something along those lines, because I was doing uh, commission work for a company in New York, editing books for way too little money, like 20 plus hours of work for a hundred dollars uh, level of <laughs> insanity. That's... Some fun books though, I will say. Absolutely. Some interesting ones. So originally that's what it was going to be. And I had already gotten my mascot made. And then I started doing this and I was like, now hold on. I can just throw dice at the end. Yeah. And get a new logo version of him with a die in his hand. And it would be <laughs> perfect. I love that. I love that. Are you able to dedicate your time full time to dice making or do you still have another? Oh, you do. So this is, this is it. This is like oh, your yeah. That's yep. awesome. I'm yeah. so happy to hear that because you are extremely talented. Having held Thank a you. set of your dice, like they are really well made. The craftsmanship is incredible. I was so sad to have to ship them off to our last giveaway winner <laughs> who got them because they are so, so well made. And so I'm so glad to see that you've gotten to a point that you can make it your full-time mm -hmm. career. And congratulations on that because that is one of the most terrifying things about starting your own business oh, is deciding... So yeah, because it, it it's a fluctuating market, like, you know, based off the con circuit, based off of the demand and, and everything like that, plus the expenses. Like, it, it's so scary, but I'm so impressed and in awe of and proud of you and I'll just, in, just inspired by you is really the word I can think of. To be able to make it a full-time career is, is so admirable and so cool. Uh, would you have any advice to anybody who's thinking of a similar creative endeavor and wants to get into, you know, creating their own business or owning their own business, what advice would you give to them as that is what you're able to do full time now? Yeah, I, gosh, uh, do a lot of research before you start, because I would say that was a huge help to me. Like, I, it is not the case for most people to uh, get to quality stuff as quickly as I did. Uh, I have an insane ability to look at something and be able to recreate it just by reading directions. And okay. I do not expect that it give yourself grace, especially if it's resin related. There's such a large learning curve. I still mess up constantly and have to throw things away because I don't want to ship out toxic items. And also just don't, don't, Expect it'll go great at first because it does. It takes time to find people and like to actually get to the point where you're willing to go out and do things. 
is I had to convince myself that doing events in person would be the way that I needed to go. And it's so much better for me than online. I love getting to talk to people. Like, I was, <laughs> it's so odd how little I enjoy doing online. I'm online constantly. Like, every time you guys see me online and serve, I'm in this room probably. I could be participating in conversations. I'm just terrible at typing words to people. Well, it, and it'll break general. the focus. You just get it distracted. It breaks the focus. You get, yeah, brought into it. So it's just easier to lurk and, and just it be is. a part of the community without I actually still am lurking. Engaging. I promise I'm reading everything all the time. <laughs> I'm there. I'm just not saying anything. That's amazing. So let's do the giveaway now for who yes. won that set of dice from Dragon Ink Dice. Tonight's winner is Jilly Roses. So it's actually one of your fellow Coterie mates who gets that wow. set of dice from you. Uh, so Wild. I don't even have to put you two in contact. <laughs> you you guys talk I'm already. I'm going to hand them to her in Georgia. I'm not so, even going to ship them. She can that's... wait. <laughs> That is perfect. Congratulations <laughs> to Jilly Roses. And Katie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me tonight. It's such an interesting conversation, and it's such a, a unique skill that you have. And I am so, again, impressed by your commitment, so enamored by the care and love that you put into the process, the fact that you turn out as many dice that you do and that they are of such good quality and you obviously love doing this. And that is all you can ask for out of a job. It's like, that's the ideal yeah. is that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, even though there's a lot of effort that goes into it. So, so much effort. <laughs> that is so, so incredible that you're able to do this. And I really do appreciate you taking the time uh, with me tonight to talk about it because there's so much that goes into it that I couldn't even begin to fathom. And you really did make it uh, something that I could, really understand and i hope everybody who had the opportunity to watch and or is listening to this later on really got something out of it because i sure did i really did i really learned so much about this process so you can go follow dragon ink dice on social media at dragon ink dice or you should go to the store most importantly and pick up a set of dice of your own at dragon ink dice dot big cartel dot com but thank you so much to my guest Katie, for being here tonight. I really, really do appreciate you. And stay tuned to all of the exciting St. Pete by Night programming coming this week. Tomorrow, we have Bloody Strings is back on for their next episode. We have Rage Across Tampa, our Werewolf the Apocalypse Chronicle on Tuesday. On Thursday, we have Don't Get Caught. On Friday, we have What the Hell Is That? Our Hunter the Reckoning Chronicle. And then we'll be back next week on Saturday for another After Dark also, we have our YouTube exclusive Mementos is off and running, which new episodes of that drop on Mondays only on YouTube. That's the only place you can find it. So go tune into those. But Katie, again, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. And thank you so much to everybody who watched. Congratulations to Jilly Roses. And we'll see you all next time. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Good night. This has been a St. Petersburg by Night production. After Dark is produced in agreement with the World of Darkness and Dark Pack. The host for After Dark is Kent. Visit our website at stpbynight.com for more information about all of our productions and how you can become part of our community. Thank you for listening. Until next time, fangs, stakes, and claws out.